that you need to know, like even in your sleep. And if you get this, that you've got almost everything about what this method is all about. Okay. So A times B is equal to C. Just to revise, what is A? Okay. Okay. Head tip. Beg pardon? Head tip, head wind. Okay, the activating event. Okay? Alright, let me see somebody else. What is the name? <coughs> activating event. Okay? So everybody knows that A is the event, the activating event. Okay, what is B? If you don't look at your notes, what is B? Belief. Okay? So B is my beliefs, or B is my self-talk, or B is my perception, or B is what I tell myself about A. And what is C? C is the? Okay, the conclusion or the consequent emotions. So the emotions. Okay, so let me say this once again, because this is what will, and then I want somebody to explain this A times B is equal to C. What does it mean? So we know that A is the activating event, you know, something that happens. B is my belief or my perception about what happens. And C is the consequent emotions. Okay, remember the, remember the first day, not the last time, but the previous time, I gave you a little uh, scenario about the train. Early in the morning, they're going into the train. Okay? So, based on that, how would you explain A times B is equal to C? What does it mean in practice? A is it's not good or bad. Good. So, okay, good. So, you stop. Somebody else. So, what makes me feel good or bad? I believe. My beliefs, or what I tell myself about A, will make me feel good or bad. So A in itself is neither good or bad, happy or sad. Okay? What I tell myself about A will make me feel good or bad, happy or sad. Okay? So there is nothing in this world that is good or bad, happy or sad. My thinking makes it so. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, if I kind of so, but we need to kind of, so there is, there are, doesn't mean that anything goes. So I say, oh, I can go up to, on the top of the building and fly, you know, so there's nothing good or bad with what I tell myself, no, you die, you know, so, so that's, there's a certain criteria we need to use to check that. So A times B is equal to C. So A in <coughs> itself is neither good or bad, happy or sad. B is what causes what my feeling, what I tell myself about A, my perception of A, that will make me feel good or bad, happy or sad. Okay, somebody give me an example. Give me an example of how a situation in itself is neither good or bad, happy or sad. So there is, and then there are, like I told you, we have two, two statements that we make. First is a rational statement. The second is an irrational statement. And that makes you feel good or bad, happy or sad. For example, for example, let's go back to the train. Remember the train again? So what is the rational statement? The rational statement is, a man walks in, sits down, and the children are jumping up and down, screaming and shouting. That's a rational statement. What's the irrational statement? Why are the kids annoying that? Good. See, and again, say, why are the kids doing that? Now, here's the thing. When you're asking the question, it is not really a question. Because if it was a question, why are the children really doing that, you wouldn't be upset if you really want to know. But when you're saying, why are the children doing that and you're getting upset, what do you really say? The children should not be doing that. You know, so you're, we're saying, you know, sometimes you say, but why do you act that way? What am I saying? I'm not asking you why do you act that way. I don't care. What I'm saying is, you should not act that way. Now that is the irrational statement that will make you feel bad. And what is the word that is not good? You should not behave that way. You should never. Should. 
must, remember, masturbation. Masturbation causes problems. Bullfighting is the solution. So should, always, never, could have, would have, may have, all these are, this, these are not good words. They're not rational words. They're irrational words. Okay, now, let's see in the last week, did something happen in your life where you felt bad about something, some situation? Maybe a general ask. Yes, I do. All right, give, it, give the example. <laughs> All right. Yes, okay, so here, first the A. What was the A? So the A is the activating event, the situation. Now here's how you talk about the situation, okay? You say, give us a situation, which means when did it happen? What time did it happen? Who are the characters involved? And what actually happened? Okay? I get a phone call from my wife saying that I can have visit my kids this week. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, and then, so this is A. So I get a phone call from my wife saying that I cannot visit my kids this weekend. Now they can be, okay, how do you feel about that? Sad. Sad. Why? Because I want some kids. Okay, good. So uh, I, I'm saying I want to see my kids. <clears throat> that is okay. Like supposing I say, uh, you know, I really want to see my kids. Will that make you sad? No, there's something else you're saying. So if you don't see your kids, what are you telling yourself? <laughs> I mean, I don't have that connection with my kids. I, don't, I, don't, I miss my kids. Okay, I miss my kids. Okay, all right. And uh, because I miss my kids, like I feel, I feel, I feel sad. Okay. So now that's kind of you know, is that abnormal? No, it is normal. It is like you know, you miss your kids. Now the problem is, how sad do you? Now, some that, that, that is true of the anger first quickly. Ah. That's my, that's my go-to emotion. Okay, so the sadness is also an emotion, but it's a healthy emotion. You know, like I miss my kids, I didn't, couldn't see my kids, so I'm kind of going to be sad. But when it turns to anger, what is the irrational, angry thoughts that you're saying, or angry words that you're using? Come on, let's say, Let's let's kind of just work this out so that you can change. You know, like you know. Yes, <laughs> my thoughts are: she's using them to get the money out of me. Okay, she's using them in order to get money out of me. Okay, supposing that's a fact. Okay, that wouldn't make you angry. You're saying something else. Okay, but Well, you're saying something else about your wife. Oh, your like you know, uh, like you know, that she's using me to get money out of me, and that is that is what that is, I don't like that. Good, I don't like that. Now, why don't you like that? Because I can't afford. Because I cannot afford. Now, supposing I could afford it, would you? Know, there would be no problem. So you would just not see your kids. No, I would see my kids buy the money. Okay, but she was still trying to get money out of you other ways and still keep not giving money. This is, this is a small situation. A small situation. Okay. All right. So, now how would you avoid kind of, you know, how would you avoid kind of, you know, getting angry? So the angry part we have not yet come to. So we'll deal with it today. We'll talk about how to, how to turn anger into an assert, assertive behavior. So, we were talking about anger last time, remember? What was anger? Anger is, others must be fair and kind to me. Otherwise, they are worthless and I feel angry, okay? So now in this situation, like my wife, please, you call me your, your wife or you call me your ex or what do you call me? I call her the ex now. She's still yeah. we're the world. Okay, all right, let's say like, you know, so your ex or your wife, um, you know, what you're saying is, should, what is making you angry? So here's the thing. Your, your ex does not uh, let you see the kids, and you're saying because she wants money out of you. Okay, is that really true? 
What's the no no no? I'm just saying like you know like what what proof do you have for that? Because I offer twenty six hundred dollars to see my kids. She wants thirty four. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so it is a money situation. Definitely a money situation. Okay, so it is a money situation. Okay, so you have proof. I'm not saying, see, I'm no, not no, saying, no. okay, I'm, I'm the trying to the process it. Right. You know, so to say, okay, so yes, so she, she says, she, if you give me that much, then I'll let you see the kids. Otherwise, I'm going to make it difficult for you. Right. I'm not going to let you see the kids. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, now to be assertive, First of all, you put a good interpretation. Now you try to put a good interpretation, you're saying, no. She said it very clearly, she wants money, so that's a fact. Okay. The second thing is, try to clarify. Like, you know, to say, you know, I, is this all about the money? Or are you trying to manipulate me with the money? And then she says, uh, I want that to be that much for the certain cars you used to buy. I've tried that. Well, I mean, right, right, I'm right. Sort of, I'm a very sort of person. But, right. But that was the question. Why do you need the money? I want to buy this certain car. Now the thing is, I can't afford this. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Then the third thing is, like you know, like correct her with kindness. And how would you correct her with kindness? You say. I told her I was I'm sorry. Well, to say this is not reasonable. This is not fair, you know, and this doesn't seem to, you know, doesn't help, doesn't help you, help me, help the kids. It's not getting us anywhere. So, but she should persist. Then you need to use every appropriate action. Okay, but see, but you need to do, but you can do all of this without anyone. Can you? Yeah, it's hard though. It is. It is. It is. It is. I'm not denying that. But it's possible. And not only really is it possible, it is healthy. See, you would be able to kind of, you know, I mean, you know, not lose so much sleep, you lose a little sleep, you know, because this is personal and this is very important. Okay? But you could do all of this without feeling the anger. Then you'll be more productive. Because when you're angry, then you get unreasonable. <laughs> then you've got no control over your mind. Then you regret the words that you said. Then you regret the things that you did because it all came under this, uh, under the influence of this emotion that is anger. So anger makes us very irrational. And anger, by the way, you know, she's probably having a great time while you're suffering. So why do you want to give her, you know, the power to get angry, uh, like to just to kind of uh, to to have this power over you? You know, already. She is kind of manipulating, you cannot see your children, there's sadness there. Now you're adding anger, which is also complicating. Now again, this is easier said than done, but it is possible. It is possible. It is learning, it is relearning. So far, many of us have been on this automatic. You know, something doesn't happen, boom, I don't get angry. Then I act on the anger, and then I regret it for the rest of my life. So to be able to pause before that and say, Okay, let me see how I can approach this in a reasonable, rational way to protect myself. Not because I love the other person, but because I love myself, you know, and I love my kids, and I like, okay. So, first put a good interpretation, doesn't work. Then you kind of, then you be, then you can do everything. Now, okay, the last step is I contact my lawyer and like see how this can be worked out. In the meantime, I can live myself, I can live my life pretty, you know, pretty calm, <coughs> happily, not, like, you know, as reasonably, I can be very functional. <coughs> Any questions about this? This time, thank you for sharing this, because this is a good example of how we feel, you know, unless you get angry, you cannot act. Unless you, I have to feel angry. It is okay, it is natural. No, it's not natural. Because it, it is not natural to hurt myself. It's not natural to put myself down. It's not natural to do something that I'll regret later. Now this is like, so, but we've been trained that way to say like, you know, and to be a man, I've got to be angry. No. Yeah, but she, she knows which button, so of course oh, yeah. Yeah, also. <laughs> right. Exactly. So she knows what, very good. So she knows what buttons to push. Now you rewire your buttons. And she keeps pushing and pushing it. He says, oh, you shaved the lock. This doesn't work. 
should try something else. You know, so for you, this is and helping you to be able to grow to the best person that you can. And what happens with your wife over there, you will apply the same principles to the rest of the world. Other situations, you know, oh, okay, here's another one, trying to press my buttons. I'm saying, I'm not going to let that happen. It will hurt me for a little while. It takes a little while to reorganize our wiring. Okay? But it's possible. It's possible. Okay, so all right. Any other any other questions? So yeah. So she knows what buttons to. Any other things that you can say about the situation that would be helpful? What do you do? I mean, I can control it. I know I know your buttons might be good, but what do you do to not you know get angry or say something that you might be very sorry? I mean, is there some type of step that you can do? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. The first thing is to back off. First thing is to back off just to kind of, you know, what do you call that? Uh, to regroup. To make sure that I am not doing something irrational that I don't think right. Okay? I used to be that kind of person. Because, but why was I that kind of person that was always angry? And I never hit, oh, yeah, maybe a couple of times I punched a couple of people. But, but otherwise, I would use my tongue, which is even worse. Because you know, punches you can forget. Words you can remember forever. So, but I would do that when I was weak. You know, now I kind of stand. First of all, here's my thing. This is the way I deal with it. Ask for steps, I'll tell you my personal thing. There are a couple of things I tell myself and brainwash myself. I say, first of all, you never try to teach a pig to sing. Has anybody tried to teach a pig to sing? No. It wastes your time and it irritates the pain. So when somebody, like you know, uh, is is irritating or ang I'm angry, I'm angry with someone, I say, you know, this person, you can't teach this person to sing. So don't let me waste my time and irritate that person, trying to make that person change. The second thing I also say to myself, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, don't fight with the pain. Because both get dirty and the pig loves it. Because the pig loves it. You know, to wallow in that. So it draws you into this fight. And now it's happy while you are bleeding and you are kind of getting more and more crazy. That's the same. The third thing about me that is kind of, you know, somebody, one of my, one of my friends described me perfectly. He said, you know, you are one of those who lose battles. You never lose the war. Okay? Let me say that again. I'm ready to lose battles, not the war. So I give in to the little things, but the war, I save my best punches for those. So if people say, oh yeah, this guy is kind of, you know, he's okay, he's. And I said, don't test me. You know, because if you push me against the wall, and you start this war, oh my God, the best of it comes out. Then I'm good. Then I'm good. You know, when I'm good, I'm good. When I'm bad, I'm very good. So I'm very good at being bad, but in a nice way. So I lose, I lose battles. I give up battles, or I give in to battles, but not the war. So I decide how important is this for me to, you know, to respond. How important is this for me to be able to, you know, to deal with this? How important is this person to you? How important is the situation? Now yours is very important, you know, because it's your kids are important. And you love your kids and you want your kids. Okay? Now how do I get this? So let me give it to the little things. But here now there's a big thing, you know, the money part. Now you bring out your best and you say, okay, if this is what it, if what it takes, I'm going to go all out but peacefully, trying to do as much as I can. So the steps, I would say first, pause, okay? I have a thing in my book that I call PQR. In any situation, you pause, then you question, you process, okay? And then you respond. Don't react, don't react. We need to be learn how to respond to situations without reacting. Because reaction, we have no control. Reaction, we will regret later. But we take time out to be able to respond to different situations. 
Okay, so that will will do more about like you know like more anger how anger management etc. But for the time being, this is what this is what I use. I don't fight with the pig. First, I don't try to teach a pig to sing because you waste your time and it irritates the pig. You know, it's like when I'm teaching my students. There are some of them who don't want to learn. So why do I spend my time on those, you know, on that person? I will try, but you know, but if the person doesn't want to, I say, like I was teaching at the community college, like there were these two guys who would come and in about 10 minutes they would and I think they were probably taking drugs at the parking lot and coming in, but that was not my business to kind of, you know. So, you can't teach them. I tried, so I would tell them, you know, before you fall asleep, please answer this question. And the whole class would laugh, because they would all see this. So, am I going to try to teach this? Try to teach this people? No. They don't want to learn. Okay? Then, and if I try, I'm wasting my time and it's irritating them because they don't want to learn, they want to sleep. You know, now if I start fighting them, oh, they'll, this would be a big battle. It will go to the team, it will go to the chair, it will go to the who knows where this will go. And do I really want that fight for these two people? No. And by the way, here, I'll give you another kind of principle of mine that I've changed, which is very helpful for you also. See, supposing you are in my place and you're teaching. Okay, you got the 20% that are smart students. Got it? 20% smart. 20% bottom, weak. And in between, you got 60% that are like average. Where would you spend most of your time? With which group? Teaching which group? With uh, the bottom. With the bottom one, right? How many of you think that it's the bottom one? Raise your hands. Okay, how many of you think the top 20%, most of your time, most of your energy? Nobody. How many thinks in the middle? Okay, good. So the answer is you spend most of your energy on the top 20. It's not, I'm not saying don't spend any energy on the bottom 20, but most of your energy. Listen carefully, because I just going to apply to myself, to yourself now. So, 60% of our energy needs to be spent on the 20% top people. Why? So, then you've got 40%, here you spend, you know, you spend 30% in the middle and 10% on the bottom. It's not that you're not, you're leaving out the bottom, or maybe like, you know, you spend 30, 20, uh, or like, you know, or 50, whatever it is. <coughs> 50, 30, 20, okay? So, 50% of your energy on the top 20, 30% in the middle, 20% at the bottom. Why? Because if you spend 20%, like 50% of your energy on the top, first of all, I've got to be on top of my teaching. I've got to prepare because they're challenging. Those 20% keep challenging. Okay? Now, if I'm focusing there, half of the middle group will catch up with the top 20%. The other half will become better. The bottom 20, some of them will become better, but some of them you're going to lose them anyway. It's not that you're, so, now the same thing with yourself and myself. We've got certain qualities that are 20% tops. Yes or no? Yes. Then we've got qualities that are in the middle. And then we've got that other kind of, you know, that weight that we have that is negative. The bottom 20%. Question. Where would you spend 50% of your energy and your time? I bet from what you have been sharing with me, you've been spending most of your time on the bottom 20% and that's why it's wasted, <coughs> wasted energy. I'm not saying ignore it completely, but if you spend 50% of your energy and your time and your thing on the top 20% of your qualities, the good things that you're doing, guess what? Your middle middle part will increase, will add that 20% will now become 30, then will become 40% because you are stretching yourself. And the last bottom 20%, some of it you will be able to take care of, other things you can just let it go. You can just let it go. It will, not, it will, it will be there but it will not bother you. 
You know, how many, like you read the Bible, right? Even if you don't read the Bible, here's like, you know, what St. Paul says. St. Paul talks about his great mystical experiences, but he says, to keep me from being puffed up, to being proud, God sent me a messenger of Satan that acts as a thorn in the flesh. His weakness, 20%, 20% bottom. He said three times, he said, I pray, deliver me, save me, help me. And God said, you will die in that weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. And here's what God said. My power is made perfect in weakness. So God's power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul said, what shall I say? I shall boast of my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In the meantime, he's focusing on the top 20%. The top 20%. So the weakness will always be there. <clears throat> will always be there. But how do I deal with weakness? There are two ways of dealing with weakness. Trying to kind of, you know, trying to uproot the weakness, which is almost impossible in many cases, of, you know, in the lives of all of us. And it's a waste of energy. Okay, let me give you one example. Years ago, I was giving this, you know, retreat. This sister, Manna, came to talk to me, and she was crying. What was she crying about? She says, for 30 years, I've been working on this weakness. It's like a big rock in my life. And after 30 years, all that I've been able to do is just chip off a little bit of, my, of that rock. Can you relate with that? You know, you've got something that you've been struggling with, working with, and after all these years, you feel it's a big rock, and only this little chip you've been able to get rid of. And it's discouraging. So she was frustrated and crying. And I was young at that time, so in my stupidity, what, and what wisdom came out was, I said, sister, why don't you make a rock garden? Make a garden. That rock is going to be there. But if you focus on the rock, you lose the garden. What is the garden? <clears throat> Develop, focus on the good qualities that you have, the talents that God has given you, the gifts that God has given you. Remember all the times you were able to use these gifts to make a difference in the lives of people. You know, and that will be the garden. And the more you focus on the garden, you know, the better your garden will look. And thanks to that rock, your garden has personality and character. You get, the, you get the comparison? But if you focus on that rock and try to beat it and break it and try to get rid of it, what have frustration? Frustration. So focus on the garden. Focus on your good qualities. Focus on the 20% and your life will get better. Let's take like, you know, and again, the other principle I also use is whatever you focus on, you give it power. So you've seen, you watch a boxing match, right? So who keeps the opponent healthy and in shape? You. The more you fight the guy, the more he's like, you know, he's shape, he's in shape. Now, if you ignore him, then he'll knock you down a couple of times. Don't fight him. After some time, he'll be there, sitting in the corner, because he doesn't have exercise, because you're not fighting him. So whatever you focus on, you give it power. So if you focus on your negativity, the bottom 20%, what happens? Bottom 20% grows bigger and stronger and makes you weak, fights you all the time, frustrates you. But if you use the same energy to focus on the positive, the positive grows bigger and stronger and the negative goes in the corner, it's there. But it's in a corner, but has no power over you. Okay? Are you, any questions about it? What do you think about it? 20% top, 20% bottom. Spend 50% of your energy on the top 20% of the gifts that you have. Yes? So are you saying, for example, like an addiction or something like that? Being uh -huh. that bottom twenty percent, if you're totally ignoring that addiction or whatever it is, then see, it's not ignoring it to say it doesn't exist. I'm fully aware of the boxer that can kill me, that can beat me up, but I'm aware of him. But I let him go. But in the meantime, so even addiction, 
See, if I'm focusing on the addiction, what happens? The addiction keeps growing. Like, you are aware of the addiction even if, if you don't want to. But in the meantime, if you keep focusing, because if you're so obsessed with your, of your, with your addiction, you've not given time for, like, you know, for the good side of your life. Like, to really appreciate the good side of you. To appreciate the good things in you. I'm not saying to deny. No, no, no. I'm not saying deny. To say, oh, no, I don't have an addiction. No, I'm just going to focus. No, 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 no. Paul says, the thorn in the flesh is there constantly to remind him of his weakness. But he's also aware of power that comes from the mystical, the great gifts that God has given. That God has given. So that thorn in the flesh will always be there to keep us humble. We all have, like, you know, a dark side and a weak side in our, in our personalities. You know, we have kind of addictions. Many of them are destruct, obvious, like, you know, maybe alcohol, drugs, and other kinds of addictions are kind of obvious ones. But some of us are addicted to, like, you know, like negative, like, my, uh, my brain is, as soon as you say something, oh, I get depressed. I feel negative. I feel hurt. That's an addiction. That's an addiction, but it is, and it is as destructive, like you know, as maybe chemical addictions. That's, am I making sense? Yes. You know, like the addiction that we have. Somebody says something, I either get angry or with the other person, or I, or I beat up myself and put myself down. Oh, I'm worthless. I will not. I will never change. Nothing will ever. Uh, nothing good will ever come out of me. Is an addiction. Is an addiction. Okay? We need to break that addiction. Be aware of it and change it. So I'm glad you asked me a question. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm, seriously, I'm not getting rid of, the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denying my addiction, but I'm still, no, be aware of my addiction, I'll focus on. Like the last time I was talking about, like, you know, what I do and who I am are not the same thing. So if a person comes with me with addictions of maybe like, you know, like alcohol or drugs, like what I do is I break the I break the whole thing up to say who I am and what I do are two different things. So who I am is divine. I'm the image of God, the likeness of God, I'm the divine essence. And I cannot change that. My addiction cannot change that. You know? But because I'm so focused on my addiction, I don't look at the divine presence. There. Now the more I see my divine presence, the more I see my divine essence. The more I see this part of me, I can deal with that. I'm saying, yeah, you don't have any power over me. You're there, but you don't have power over me because my focus is on this side. Okay, good. I'm glad that you. Anybody else? This is a good conversation, you know. And by the way, is questions are always good. Answers may sometimes be good, sometimes may not be. So don't be afraid of questions. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Like a on yeah, right? See? Oh, Body language. My, my, my problem is that I, I'm a good person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I, but I don't know the, the littlest thing. The what? The littlest thing. Uh -huh. It takes me off. But I'm only mad for maybe five, ten minutes. Then I'm back to being the same see, old crazy see. person that I've been. You know, I'm not understanding that. Okay. Good. So here's the thing. So you are basically a good person. Okay? Now, even though, no, no, you know what? Even though the, the others laugh, you still will not give up and should not. Even this should. Or <laughs> it will be very healthy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Here's the masturbation of the shirts. All right. So it is very helpful not to give up my idea of, like, you know, my goodness. So I, I'm really, and it's, and I'm good not because I say this. I'm good because God made me good. So I'm not going to deny that. So even if people tell me, you know, all the time, oh, you're good, oh, that's, no, you know. Yeah, but that's, but don't get hooked with that. The more they laugh, the more they are saying, when you deep down, you, you convince yourself, and look at yourself, I'm saying, like, the, from the eyes of God, to say, you're good. Okay? Now, the little things upset you for a little while. 
do you want them to continue to upset you? No, I'm, I'm just trying to make a good mood all the time. They're trying to be? Make a good mood all the time. Now that kind of is not is not practical, right? <laughs> it's not always practical because I mean there will be times because of because of our human nature, right? We can be we'll go up, we'll go down, we'll go up, we'll go down. But if your if your goal is like I must be perfect. No, I try to be perfect. Can you right? Yeah. <laughs> it's always good to try, but you cannot demand that you should be perfect. Which is good. So you have to try to be kind of good and you've got to try to be perfect. And you've got to try to be happy more and more, you know, and maybe get upset less and less. Even if it is one time less, it is still less. And then to give yourself that reward to say, yes, I have, I've kind of, you know, so I've overcome that. No, this is, this is, this, this is important. Okay? So, Basically, you know that you're a good person. There are times the little things upset you for a little while. Now, do you want to continue? Want the little things to continue to upset you, even for a little while? That's your. That's you. That's what you need to. You need to decide. You know. So, and how do you do that? By trying to change my beliefs, my perception, my self-talk, or what I'm saying about it that is upsetting. You know, you either say, oh my God, like, you know, I'm, like, I'm not worth anything, these people keep telling me, or I'm saying, they are whatever, you know, useless people, or I'm getting angry with them. Even if for a little while, it's not helpful. Like, you've got to be like the giant. To say, you know, once you find yourself, you become like this, like, you know, like a world heavyweight champion. And all these other guys are like little kindergarten kids. Thing. Sir, I'll beat you. And what will you do if a little kid comes, like a little guy, so I'm going to beat you? What would you do? You'll get upset? Yeah, so when these guys do that, just shrink them down to a little bit like that <laughs> and, and laugh at them. Just say, like, you know, these are little kids. You know, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. They're little kids. They're not going to touch my goodness. They're not going to touch my basic, no, it's, and every time somebody says something like that, I use that to build my own goodness and my own strength. Okay, good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, when you're trying to be in that good space, but then you have all these outside uh, forces, like people, people are saying, Man, how can you be so calm about that situation? What I would have done is blah, 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 blah. And then that, that's escalated even more. Right. Good. So how would you respond to that? You know, people say like, how could you be so calm? You don't get upset. I and mean, they tell me that. Yeah. They tell me, they say like, you know, I mean, this person just insulted you. Right. And you try to act like God. Like no, I'm just kind of, I'll tell you, okay, I'll give you a situation. Uh, I was teaching at St. Louis University years ago. And in the middle of the class, you know, one of the students at the, at right at the end, at the end of the class, he yelled and he said, you are full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, now the outside forces, I'm a teacher and I think I'm a great teacher and like, I'm teaching and my student yells in the class to say, you are full of shit. Okay, now how would you react to that? Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. And then what would happen? I asked him where he get that analogy from. Where did that come from? Good. And that's what I asked him. I said, First of all, you know, first of all, what I said was, I said, excuse me, I said, did you say something? He said, yeah, I said you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the thing, it's not that easy, because, you know, say I was teaching a, a cross-listed course, so there was like students that have taken this course for psychology, and students that have taken this course for theology, okay? So, what happened was, 
in a split second I knew. And when I was teaching a course, if there were 60 students in the class, I was teaching at least 600 people. Why? Because as soon as the class was over, my students would run with their dormitories, call their parents, tell them about everything that was happening in the class, and you know, the things that they learned, and, you know. So I knew in a split second that 600 people would hear tonight that somebody in the class said that I was full of shit. I also knew that this would go to the chair of my department, two departments, psychology and theology, at the university, where a student got up in the middle of the class and said, I was full of shit. So, this is the real situation. So now, how do I respond? So I said, let me try and be assertive. So my first thing is, you know, to have a sense of humor. My first sense of humor was, shit, how did he find out? <laughs> so my first thing I said, how did he find out that I was full of shit? I mean, that was being funny, you know, so that calmed me down. And then I asked him, I said, first, did you say something? He said, yes. I said, oh, and all the other students had to turn white. They were already white. They turned like ghosts. <laughs> because they never expected somebody at the university level to stand up in class and say, tell his teacher he's full of shit. So, so I said, so why do you think? that I'm full of shit. He says, well, you hate Hindus. And I said, oh. I said, is that why you, I said, you know, I'm sorry I gave you that impression. On the contrary, I said, I love Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and I've been teaching you to respect all religions, etc., people, but if I gave the class an, an impression that I hate Hindus, I really apologize. So I started asking the rest of the class, do you feel that I was, that I hate Hindus? You know, everybody said, no, no. Some of them didn't even know the question, but the grade was in my hand, so they said, no, no. <laughs> so, you know, I, so then I said, you know, I really apologize if I gave you that impression. Now, am I angry? No. I learned to be, this, like, I learned to be kind of, you know, assertive. My instinct would, was to say, take your bags and get the hell out of this place. Right. What would have happened? I would have lost him forever. You know, now if I said, oh my God, you know, this fellow, you know, I'm from India, now what am I going to do? I'm helpless. I, I would have lost, he would have lost me. Because I would say, like, I'll wait for my chance to get to you. So I decided to be a sir. So he said, I hate Hindus. I said, I'm sorry. So I continued to teach. And I said, look, this is, but, and I was not even talking about Hinduism that day. I was not, I was talking about some psychology. And in the middle, he said, see, so I said, excuse me, he said, no, no, it's okay. So then again, I said, you know, you're, you're not letting me teach. So being, not being angry doesn't mean you just let people do whatever they want to do. No. So I said, I said, you know what, you're not letting me teach. So if you would like to speak in this class, kindly raise your hand, get my permission, and then you may talk. I said, is that clear? He said, yes. So I continued to teach and he disrupted the class again, you know. So I told him, I said, you know, the next time you do this, I will have, I will have to ask you to leave the class. And he did. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, would you mind leaving the class now? And then you wait and don't, and be clear, you know, be clear. So he got out. And of course the rest of the class again became even whiter because they never expected anybody at the university level to be kicked out of the class. So this guy goes straight to his advisor and his advisor gives me a call to say, could you tell me what happened because the student came here had just left complaining that you insulted him, you kind of were not respectful, you made you humiliated him and that in the class in front of everybody by asking him to leave the class. So I had to explain to his advice over the phone that he said I was full of shit. <laughs> explain everything that happened in the class. So he told me, he says, are you aware that this, this kid is on drugs? He's high. He came to my office and he was walking into the walls and we had to help him out. He, the advisor told me, whatever decision you make, 
I will back you up. So I told him, I said, you know, if there's any way I can help the kid, I'll be, I'll be willing to reach out to this kid because he's got a problem. Again, I'm strong. This is a little kid trying to say, I'll beat you up. I said, really? Try me. So, yes. So, so then what happened was, I went to, on campus, there's a little group that takes care of, you know, students with problems, addictions of different kinds. So I went and approached them and I said, here's a kid that needs help. Keep me out of this. You know, I don't want him to know that I've come to you, but I want you to help him. So they went and got a hold of him and they were able to help him. So after a couple of weeks, he calls me and says, can I come back to the class? Okay, what would you say if you were in my place? Yes. Big I thought I was If I you, knowing you, yeah, I don't know that. I would suggest that you're willing to learn it. Yes. So it is not simply to say, oh yes, you can come back and do what you did again. No. I said, you can come back to the class provided you do not disrupt the class again. You know, that's being assertive. It doesn't mean like, you know, yeah, you can come back and not say something else about me. And no, you will not be disrupted in the class. And he says, oh, I do apologize. He said, I really feel ashamed of what I did. And I promise it will not happen again. I said, you're welcome to come back. He came back and I treated him like I treated all my students as if nothing had happened. Why? Because I'm strong. Why? Not because I decided to be strong. You know, not because I was strong, but I decided to use this opportunity to be able to say that I am. And then he came, after a week, and he came to talk to me, and he said, he said, I, I want to apologize for what happened in the class that day. He said, my best friend died by suicide, and when he died, I couldn't deal with it, so I, take, I started taking drugs. But he said, don't worry, he said, I've been getting help. Of course, I knew where you were getting help from. So I kind of, you know, so he, so I, so when you're assertive, you, you keep the doors open for communication and the relationship to continue. If you're passive, you know, you lose the other person. If you're aggressive, the other person loses you. If you're assertive, like, you know, you can. So we resolve the situation, you know, that way. Now, here's the, here's the best part. At the end of the semester, all the students have got to write evaluations of the class. And they all write, you know, this was the best course, this was wonderful. And by the way, P.S., you are not full of shit. So, <laughs> now these evaluations go to the chair of the department, to the two departments. So the two chairpersons are saying, what is this? <laughs> so they call me to buy, explain what this is all about. What, so, so here, when you're in a situation like this, if you're assertive, you're the strong one. If you react and get angry, it comes, anger comes from weakness. Anger comes from weakness. Now don't suppress your anger. Don't repress your anger. If you're angry, come back, come to your room, kind of, you know, and maybe beat up a pillow or something like that, or go and yell in the wind or something, like do whatever you want, but don't take it out on the person who is, because then you come back, find yourself, and you can be strong. Learn how to be more certain than be you know, then, then, then be angry and I'll give you another example. Uh, any questions about this first of all? Then I'll give you the other example. Because we learn by examples. So this is anger. Like you know, so yes we we do have anger, but how do we deal with anger? So I've kind of you know decided anger is a waste of my energy and it's not good for my health. I'm going to. Here's another example. I was teaching high school back in India. And uh, and then I was coaching. You know, I was the athletic director. And there was this guy who was like best athlete that we had. So like you know we so when we he was he was good in soccer. Like he was a soccer player. But he would come for practices whenever he wanted because he was good, you know. Then he would take his his uh, his uh, whatever equipment or whatever that he had, throw it there, throw it there. The other kids had to collect it and bring it back to the school. And uh, so one day, so the kids told me this is what has happened. Now, 
assertive behavior. What is the first thing that you do? First put a good interpretation, you say, no, this is something more. Go ahead and talk to him and say, is this what is happening? I hear that you don't come for practices regularly. I hear that you have just kind of throw your thing wherever you want it. And, uh, and I said, I would appreciate it. Ask for what you want. You know, the, okay, well, when you're talking about clarification, well, assert about the, I'll come back again. I said, I would appreciate it if you came for practices every day, every time, and you did what every other kid is doing. He said, I will not. What are you going to do? Okay? Now, I will not. What are you going to do? <coughs> I told him, I said, you know what? I love a challenge. So don't challenge me. Back off now. He said, go, do whatever you want. I said, okay. He was with his house captain. I told him, I said, from today, you are suspended from all sports for a whole year. Okay. He said, yeah, we'll see. Why do you, why do you think he was saying that? Because he's the best. He thinks he's the best. Good. Good. That is one. Another, he had another reason. Because you think that you cannot replace him? Uh, no, he knew I would replace him. He thought I couldn't. Why? No, no. no. He had connections. Oh. With whom? With the vice principal of the school. So the vice principal of the school, he had him in his, in his, he was in his back pocket. He was like, you know. And so we would have a meeting every Monday. And of course, I was prepared. The vice principal said, who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing by suspending this fellow? So I explained to the principal and everybody else in the team, I said, here's what happened. Here's the principles that I'm trying to teach these kids. I said, I was an athlete. Like, you know, for me, athletics is an education of personality, of character, training ourselves for life, you know. I said, this is what happened, and this is what I did. And the principal said, good, don't change. Okay? All right. Then, of course, the meeting got over. In the recess time, this kid came running to me. What, was, what do you think he told me? He started to get your butt. No, he, no, that he wouldn't say. He, he brought Jesus. He said, you know, Jesus said, forgive and forget. Come on. <laughs> he said, can you forgive me? I said, I have nothing to forgive. I have nothing to forgive. You challenged me man to man. You, take, you took up the challenge. Stay with the challenge. Except and I get what say, pardon? Except the consequences. Yes, yes, exactly. So for a whole year, the poor kid who was so good did not play. And the worst day was on, on inter-schools, like, you know, athletics, the athletics day, the sports day, he was a great track runner. His girlfriend was a girl champion. He was the boys champion. That year, he stood on the stands, sat on the stands, and watched everybody run. Now my heart was bleeding for him. Why? Because I was also a champion. And I know what it means to be on the track and what it means to be watching other people when you could be, you know, over there. But I simply said, assert when you assert yourself, I will be with you. But you're going to be the you know what? He had such respect for me because he knew it was not hateful. He knew I loved it, I loved him. He knew that you know there was nothing to forgive, but I was talking about behavior. On him. So that year, when he was suspended, his mother was in the hospital. He came running to me, he says, like, you know, he says, can you come and can just help my family? I need your help. He didn't go to the vice principal because he had no respect for the man. Because he was getting handouts from him and he was like, you know, he could manipulate him. So I put him on my motorbike, took him to the hospital and I was with the family all through. You know, after that year, he went to college, and he was a great. He continued to be doing to do very well. And any time his, his picture was in the newspapers, he always had a cutting that he sent to me. 
Now that is part of being assertive. Now if I had acted any other way, I would have no respect for him, he would have no respect for me, and he would have been a gone case. Today if he is doing well in life, it is because I suspended him that year. Not because I wanted to, he challenged me, he dealt with it, he knew I loved him, but not his behavior. I would do anything for him, but not accept and condone behavior. And that is being assertive, rather than being angry. Okay? Alright. So, let me, let me end with, like, you know, what do you call that? Uh, uh, the steps of assertive behavior. So the first one is, uh, put a good intention. Put a good interpretation. The second is clarify. Now I want you to pay attention to this clarify. How do I clarify? The first thing that you say is, uh, or what you say, ask the person, you know, what the person meant by what the person was saying or doing. The second way of clarifying, give me attention here, is to, to, uh, to express your feelings. To express your feelings. You know? And the third way of clarifying is to ask for what you want. Let me, and the third is the third is very important. So the first way of clarifying is, uh, like ask the person, you know, like let's say, what do you call that? Remember I was telling you about that case about the husband that was coming late every Wednesday night? Remember? Okay. So ex like to clarify to say, the first way of clarifying is to say, honey, you know, you've been, you seem to be coming late every Wednesday and you're coming with that perfume that is not mine. What's going on? Okay, if he explains it, you're satisfied, anger bound. Okay, the second thing is to express how you feel. So you say, you know, when you come late, I trust you. When you come with that perfume, I understand. But I just want you to know, I feel very insecure. And, it, and it's not a good feeling. Okay, to express how you feel. The third is to ask for what you want. Now that's very important because what happens is, again between like you know, like husbands and wives and like you know with people, we play this guessing game. See very often a woman will come home from work. She's had a bad day, either at school or at the workplace and rather than coming to you directly and telling you, you know honey, I've had a bad day, would you kind of be around, just sit with me, I need you. She'll start whining, she goes, ee, 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 ee. of course, once she's whining, you dress up and you get up and you go. You know, get out of the house, and then she finishes the whine. Because you cannot deal with this. And then you come back and then she complains. She says, you know, I took a bad day, and you were not there, you just got, she said, okay. she said, like, you know, I said, I didn't know. So I tell women, I said, you need to tell men, you know, when you have, when you need something, ask them directly. Come and say, honey, I've had a bad day. I would like you to be around. Please stay with me. And then I tell them, I said, you know, men are wonderful. You know, they'll make you a cup of tea, they'll get your bath ready, maybe they'll open a bottle of wine, they'll sit with you. And women complain. They say, but he's my husband, he should know. I said, we men are idiots, we don't. We need to be told, you know. Are you listening? <laughs> Yes. Now, when you want a man to do something for you, you have to tell him at least four times. He doesn't listen. The first time he hears but doesn't do anything. You know, suppose they say, you know, honey, the trash has to be taken care of. Like there has been, has to be, you know, like get, 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 get rid of the trash. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah means nothing is done. So then, the second time, but you don't get angry because you know you've got to tell him four times. So the next time you say, honey, trash, he says, oh my God, I forgot. Yes, yes, yes. The third time you say, trash, but without getting angry, you know. And then finally, take the trash and throw it out. So that goes for anything. I mean, I'm not saying we men should use that as an excuse, but you know, we kind of don't, we don't always listen at the first time. And so therefore it frustrates. So ask for what you want. Like even among yourselves, you know, among yourselves, like I had like, you know, superiors and bosses that when I would come in there, everybody else would complain about me. And so they would kind of, you know, keep on 
pouring all those complaints out. And I told them, I said, you know, all that is true. Me, some of it is true, some of it may not be true, but I'll accept that. But I'm not, like, wasting my life. I've also done a lot of good things. So I would appreciate it if you would tell me something good about me. Now, that's not easy to kind of, you know, to go and say, like, you know, to say, you know, tell me, say something good about me. Yeah, you're all of that, but can you tell me one good thing about me? But I need to hear. Okay, what I tell people is, if you cannot ask your boss and you cannot ask your, your co-workers, go to the bathroom, look at the mirror and say, I'm good. And I did a good job. Give yourself a pat on the back. Even though other people don't, you need it, give it to yourself. Okay? So ask for what you want. Ask for what you want. And I tell, I, I know with my friends and with people, I just say, you know, here's what I really would like. And sometimes what happens is, like with friends, like every one of us needs a little appreciation and a little love sometimes more than other times. You know, it's like we're not always on this. We're sometimes down and sometimes. So with my friends, I would do the same thing. Why? And my friends would say, look, if you want my appreciation and love, ask. Don't go yee yee. I said, okay. So we had a code. So anytime I needed a little appreciation and love, I would use the code word. And my friend would say, you know, I've been thinking about you. Of course, if you're friends, you're thinking about me all the time, hopefully. You know, or a lot of the times. And I was thinking about, you know, all the wonderful work that you do. You know, the way you help people and the way. And I remember the thing that you told me, which is really helping me. See, I needed appreciation. The way I asked for it is, with my friend, I established a code. So when my friend needed appreciation, my friend would use the code. And I would say, yeah, you know, I was also thinking about you. And I don't know whether this makes sense. It sounds a little kind of phony, a little put on, but this is what I'll, we play guessing games and then we get hurt. So, Clarify, ask for the person, how the person means, express how you feel, and ask for what you want. Ask for what you want. Yes? Can, how can you deal with the person that uh, he thinks he already knows everything? Even whatever you tell him or you try to keep it, just say, uh, he already said that he already know. But it seems like he don't, he don't want to take whatever <laughs> that uh, situation that you're telling him. How can you deal with that? Okay, so supposing like, okay, you got, a, you got a situation where this person, whatever you tell the person, they say, the person says, I know. Okay, so you say, fine. So give the person the benefit of the doubt. But when, when the work is done and the work is not done according to, then you say, can we talk about this? Don't say, I told you, you know. You say, like, you know, can we kind of, can we have a conversation about this? Because, like, you know, we talked about this, you said you know, but it doesn't seem to have translated into reality. So can we kind of, you know, work out, can we work at a, at a you know, do something differently so that you get it done, we are both happy and satisfied and we can be wonderful. So rather to say like, you know, oh yeah, this fellow just thinks. And of course, if you go with that attitude, he's going to say, yeah, you think you know everything? So, so it works like, you know, like fit for that. Like, so it is, uh, yeah, I would say if a person like, you know, just kind of knows that, like some of my students just say like, oh, I don't need your help. I said, good. So let your paper come to me, and I'll show you what help you need. So then I go through the paper, and I kind of put all those red marks, and all those, the same, like, you know, the columns, and say, here's your paper. Oh, like, you know, like, you know, you, you don't understand. I said, okay, take it to somebody else. And that other person understands. Let me, I'm open to say I don't understand because I'm from India and I probably think differently and speak differently. You know, but take it to somebody else and if somebody else thinks differently, 
like one student of mine, you know, he got a he got a C in my class. So he said, why did you get a C? I said, because you don't know how to write. He said, but this other professor gave me three A's. I said, really? Take this paper to the other professor and tell him to grade it for me, and I'll be calling him. Of course, the other fellow got because the other fellow wants to be popular, so he gives everybody A's. So he told him, and this fool goes to him. And this, <laughs> and this fellow kind of, you know, what do you call that? His professor told him, he says, oh, different people have got a different criteria for all. So he told me, he says, you know, he says, why did you give me a C? I said, I can give you a C. You got a C. I said, besides, I said, when you're making a fool of yourself after you get your degree, I said, I don't want people to, you to tell people that I gave you a name. So he comes with his final paper. He says, my brother who's a lawyer has helped me to write this paper. I said, I hope your brother who's a lawyer also knows how to write. <laughs> you know, he's trying to threaten me, like, you know, my brother's a lawyer, so you better be careful about it. No, you, it's like, see, I've got to be objective, not personal. I'm not saying, oh, you are, there's something wrong with you because you think you know everything. You know, so I'm saying, let's talk about, you may think you know everything, but let's talk about the work. So I give you this work, then we sit back and we'll, let's have conversations about did it go well, did not go well, and then we can. Now sometimes you may not be able to do it directly, you know, one on one. Then you need a third person to be like a mediator between the two. Because maybe you're not all right. Maybe the other person is not all right. You know, so therefore I need to say, okay, I'm sorry, the way I did it, or the, my approach, or my thinking, you know, and I need to learn how to be better. So it is to be for a mutual, to keep the relationship and going, you know. Like you can, you can express yourselves, but at the end, disagree and commit to the relationship even more. But I'll talk about that a little more, like, you know, steps, you know, like in a relationship is always built on brokenness. Always built on brokenness. But brokenness that I don't use an, as an excuse and the other person doesn't use as a weapon, you know, to come at me at times of like arguments to say, oh yeah, your weakness. No, 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 no. Don't bring in that weakness in this argument, my brokenness, because I share that with you. Okay? Now if that thing is built on brokenness and mutually ex accepted and then you can fight like, like cats and dogs. But at the end of it, you will commit even more. So you will disagree, but you will commit more. And once you have you've got you have got this commitment, then there's accountability. And when there's accountability, there's growth. But I'll, that will be for another day. Another day, but I will you know, this whole thing about how do I how do I overcome like you know anger, differences, conflict. How do I overcome conflict? Conflict is bound to happen. And if there's conflict, there's growth. If there's no conflict, then that's problems. It's like in many of the church groups, you know, there's, they're having a meeting on what to do. And one of the ladies said, oh, we should get balloons and, and everybody is going But nobody will say anything, you know, because they don't want to hurt the person. They don't want to have this conflict, you know, what will... So everybody says, oh, you will have balloons. Nobody said it. But as soon as the meeting is over, everybody is saying, <laughs> oh my God, you mean, you mean, no, no, it doesn't help. So you come back, so, but if you say, you know, I think balloons is not a good idea. You know, don't say like, you know, it's the most stupid idea I've ever heard, but just say, I don't think balloons is a good idea. So, or maybe we can talk a little bit more about the balloons. <laughs> you know, but if there's no conflict, there's no growth. Because if there's no, if you don't bring it out on the table, what are you doing? As soon as you get out, you're talking about, you know, it's very disruptive. It's very, it's, it breaks, it breaks group and breaks community and breaks friendship. Okay, uh, I think we'll leave this at here. Uh, I'll leave this at here uh, over here. The last part is depression. How do we overcome depression? But we'll do that next, you know, the next Thursday. <coughs> and then we'll go over these other sheets that we, other things that we have. And we'll do a lot of practical things as we go along. All right, any one last question or anything that...
Okay, I want you to just spend like, you know, I'm not going to ask you to say this aloud this time, but I like you like, you know, just for 30 seconds to think about what am I going to take out of what, what happened today for me, okay? So you don't have to talk about it, but I just want you to think about, so what is, what is something that I, that I learned today that I'm going to make part of my life, at least try it out, practice, or want it to happen, okay? What about one minute? Just in silence, let's just sit quietly and think about this for a minute. 